Well, you're on your fourth hour of copyright law on a sunny, warm afternoon. <laughs> this better be engaging, I suppose. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me across. Um, there's 306 sections of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act in the UK, and I'm going to go through each... No, I'm not. That's, you'll be glad to hear. Um, I think what would be most useful to you is to hear a little bit about, obviously, uh, our experience at Just Legal of how we support the education sector in, in, in education sectors indeed in the UK and um, bring out messages that might be of value to you. Um, well, shall move on from there. Um, you'll see that um, that I do also like using Creative Commons uh, licensed um, images. One little tip here is there's a, a tool called Expert, and that's the word expert without the e at the beginning, which um, allows you to find. Uh, Creative Commons licensed images and it will automatically put in the attribution into the image which I find very useful. So there we go. And there's someone toying with uh, copyright on their laptop. Um, yeah, that's me. As you can see I'm not shy so please feel free to heckle or question as we go along. Um, and yeah, I do have more than one kilt. And I don't have those socks with me today. Uh, I think it's rather unfortunate. And we have incidental inclusion of a squirrel in that photograph. Uh, please do get in touch with us, though remember the international code if you're phoning, That's, uh, in terms of that. We, we will do our best. We do have a help desk, which is obviously for our supported sectors in the UK, but we'll do our best to answer any questions or, or try and uh, point you in the direction of an answer um, if we manage to find any spare time, which is a bit short at the moment. Um, we, we have an extensive website that, uh, that was shown earlier, and uh, copyright makes up about oh, a little bit over half of our work, in fact, so it's our major area. I'll move out here. I, can, I think I can manage to make my voice heard up the back there. Um, what I will say is that well, just legal, our mission is uh, ensuring that legal issues are not a barrier to the, the good, the beneficial use of technology in teaching, learning, research and administration. So we try and solve all the legal issues. Admittedly, we are a grand total of five lawyers, about four FTE, uh, covering 650 colleges and universities, plus work-based learning, plus adult and community education. So um, uh, we don't get much sleep or time off. But uh, <coughs> what it does allow us to do is to learn from each institution. And so we have got quite a hub of experience uh, within our team. Please say we have a very low staff turnover as well. I'm not sure if that's because we can't get jobs elsewhere. No, I, you don't. it's because we really enjoy our jobs, of course. And so we might keep that collective expertise. Uh, and we've tried to distill it into here. We have some particular sections that might be interesting that are actually, uh, well, up here, we have frequently asked questions. <coughs> and actually, since I've taken that screenshot, we've added how-to documents as well. And we try and actually advise on uh, how, to, um, uh, yeah, how to get past the barriers, how to make life easy. Myself, I was a lecturer in law for 10 years, and I did all sorts of things wrong. And in the UK at the moment, we still have an awful lot of lecturers who are reinventing the wheel, paraphrasing other people's stuff for the purpose of creating online learning materials, because they think they can't use other people's materials. They can, but they, they have to obviously be aware of copyright <coughs> in order to do it. We don't actually call copyright copyright anymore in terms of workshops. We call it uh, how to use other people's stuff and how to use other people's stuff online for the, the vast part of the majority of what we do. Um, and that's really what it's about. I, I, and again, there's a little bit of uh, changing the way in which we think and approach. Uh, if you're going to uh, spice up your PowerPoint slides by going ahead with right click as a result of a Google search, then that could be problematic in the future. <laughs> that's not the way to go about it. Well, please use our website, have a look. So, um, very briefly then about the UK experience. I'm going to go through this, um, a little bit about the importance of compliance and where we're trying to get to with uh, academia. And then I'm going to give you, very, very briefly, my 10 top tips that I tend to give to academic staff. Um, so, UK experience. We've currently got a government agenda that's a bit mixed. We've got some changes to the law that went out through Parliament yesterday, in fact. Um, some got rejected, but with regards to education, museums, libraries and archives and preservation and disability, we got some uh, exceptions, new exceptions, which in some cases means we catch up with you in Ireland. In other cases, we jump ahead a little bit. I'm not going to go through those in any detail. 
Um, but we have got a government agenda uh, which was led, first of all, by the idea of innovation, creative industries, great. And then they got lobbied by the rights holder organisations who says, oh, we have to be careful. And we live in a fairly difficult age because many rights holders haven't yet sorted out their business models. And this is intensely annoying. Because it would be lovely to just go and have this idea of paying for stuff and getting it. Go to iTunes. Buy a song off iTunes. Well, you're not buying a song, you're buying a license to listen to the song and to use it. But you try and find the bit of iTunes that allows you to buy it, to play in class, and to put up onto a VLE. It's not there. iTunes is basically for personal use. Now, we're getting better models as it goes by. Uh, for those of you who are tutors, lecturers, uh, or, or indeed anyone, uh, I, would, I could, could go around and ask you, what budget do you have for licensing materials? Now, I know enough about academia to, uh, academia to know what sort of answer you'd say. You might have a book budget, maybe, uh, or through the library, have some like that, but it will all tend to be very vague at best. And again, we're going to have to think about the way in which we procure materials uh, and make this part of it. Because once upon a time, it was about getting physical copies of things. It's no longer that. It's now about getting the rights to do stuff. And life is changing. Once upon a time, I would stand here and deliver to a class. And perhaps it would stay here, and what I was doing here didn't really matter. Now, uh, today, we've got a situation where this is being beamed to, who knows, I, I don't actually know where it's being beamed to. Hello, Mum. That's, um, but, but it's going out there, and it's possibly being recorded. And indeed, as academics, then this is probably what we want, actually. And again, it, uh, it always pains me a little when I hear an academic say, it's okay, I'll just keep this locked up behind a password on the VLE. Is that what we want from academia? Uh, it's probably not. And so the idea of sharing is bigger. And the idea of the digital world being bigger is always happening. The reuse is happening. So we have to think ahead in terms of licensing. It's all very well to stick a Disney video into your PowerPoint slides. If it goes nowhere else and nobody ever finds it again, is that the ambition for your materials? I think that's a question worth asking. So, uh, we have got this government agenda here, which is, again, mixed up. And uh, the UK government are trying to do it. We're trying to come up with something called a copyright hub. And the idea of this will be a sort of eBay for licensing, where you can go and you can say, I actually want these rights, yeah, they, this particular license, and a day later I'll come back and say, that will cost you 3,822 euros. And you can say, stuff that. I'll just copy it anyway. No, no you won't say that, of course. Um, but at least then you'll be able to ask for what you want, because at the moment one of the big problems is not being able to get what it is you need. Um, in the UK, more so perhaps than here, the licensing agencies, and we have a copyright licensing agency, which admittedly is a, a more useful in a way because it covers all UK publications except those that are accepted. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's an insurance back uh, warranty based. Uh, license, so it's broader. It's not a, a, a set list of publishers, so that's quite nice in a way. Admittedly, when it comes to the digital world, uh, then it's uh, then it's a sign in a, 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 an opt-in system for publishers, which is more difficult, especially since a whole bunch of American publishers have just opted out, and there's a whole bunch of universities in the UK having to remove materials, and they're having to remove materials because the American publishers haven't really sorted out their business model for how they want to deliver stuff. And again, we're living in this difficult transitional era, I think. Um, talking about culture, organisations and people, I think it's very interesting. I've toured the UK quite a lot, giving presentations, and uh, often uh, I've come across barcodes on staplers where they belong to an asset register. And then you ask, I ask the, the institution, right, who owns your teaching material? Well, we have a policy. Okay, <laughs> I see the policy. And quite often, and I think uh, there was a, it might be uh, alluded to here, uh, it's often based on sharing of patent royalties, uh, the, 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 the IP policy, and rarely is it particularly sophisticated on teaching materials. Um, last week I was uh, dealing with uh, an inquiry from an institution, and it's being sued for £10,000. It's a fairly major university, and really its IP policy is not really very good at all. And this was concerning language tutors in the university. And language tutors, and I think this probably goes for many institutions, 
are taken on on a fairly informal basis. They are you get a few hours here and there. They're not really contracted to in a formal way to produce learning materials. Um, some of them use learning materials between different institutions. And this is quite common in language uh, tutoring, and it might be uh, the case in other areas as well, and maybe with the way academia is going, I think, well, there's various ways in which it could go, but, uh, but certainly there are issues there. But what there was not is clarity as to who owned the teaching materials and what they could be used for. <coughs> and there's uh, some very interesting disputes that I've been involved with with this. And uh, I used to work alongside uh, someone uh, who was a very competent lawyer, and he put copyright his name at the bottom of all his PowerPoint slides. And yet he knew full well there was no agreement to the contrary from, from our de default situation, which is that the employer owns the materials created in the course of employment. And also the way in which our definition of course of employment has gone means that if you're doing it towards your employment contract as the main purpose, it doesn't matter on which computer or at what time you're doing it at, the only thing that you look at is to the purpose. Are you trying to fulfill your employment contract by it? That's in the course of employment. <laughs> so, uh, again, this is a person who full well just could not accept the employer owning the teaching and learning materials. Like into a secret, at least this is not being recorded, huh? Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but when I left my employment as a lecturer after 10 years, I had a lot of materials that I wanted to take with me. And I've got that disc. I have it. And those materials, of course, would never be used again in another institution, without it, but only as taking the ideas, of course. Um, but a, a great example comes from two colleges in the north of England. One was trying to enter the digital world of uh, teaching and learning for nurses in particular. Now, nurses, difficult crowd to deal with because shifts, tired uh, often, um, they, they have to take the odds here and there to get in, and, and time is a difficult thing for them to manage. So the idea of being, being able to access continuing professional development anytime, any place, all very good. So this institution had this idea. A local institution was already uh, delivering a traditional CPD course, uh, which really wasn't suiting the nurses, but was actually being sold pretty well. So what the new institution did was it uh, stole a couple of members of staff, poached them from uh, the other institution, and during the course of a spring <coughs> and summer, created a whole lot of distance learning materials. And it came to September, and they had 40 students <coughs> signed up at £2,000 each. So quite a nice little earner. Until it got to uh, the uh, end of August, and they were about to start the course, and uh, the first institution that was offering the traditional version of CPD got wind of this and got access to the materials, and it turned out that the, the people who were poached had just copied over their materials. And the first institution said, those are our materials who were created in the course of employment, and that was right. <coughs> and the second new college had to withdraw the course at the last minute, leaving 40 disappointed people, a bad reputation, a gap in the funds that they expected to get. And they, as far as I know, they never actually managed to launch that course. So understanding who owns this stuff is very important. And also, uh, we live in an age as well where materials have got their value. And um, <coughs> University College Cork, for example, wants to ensure that after you've left, if you're a member of staff here, that those materials can be used as well. Something's going to have to be done. Now, that doesn't have to come down to blows, I don't think. We advised a, 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 a creative arts type institution um, in the UK, and uh, they were having a dispute with their staff because the institution wanted to own the creations of the staff, and the staff couldn't accept this. They were performers, uh, for the most part, in the creative arts. Um, and we suggested in the end that the performers actually retain copyright, they, they, they copyright the institution accept <coughs> that the lecturers have copyright in their materials and performances that were recorded, but that the performers gave a license to the institution for the institution to do what it had to do. And that was acceptable to all. There was no need for a fight. I think up in, uh, actually in academia in many parts of the world, this fight is still to be had and the discussions to be had and sorted out. I think if you are in charge of creating materials, then you need to be aware of these and you need to sort out the agreement beforehand. Before someone sits down and creates a distance learning module, a MOOC, whatever, the, the, the question of who is owning the materials needs to be sorted out. If someone's bringing in their photo collection in archaeology to include on the BLE, someone needs to ask the question, well, who's going to own that in future? Because if it was created before, out with course of employment because they were on holiday in the Middle East, then it's certainly not going to be in institutions because it wasn't created in the course of employment. So if it's to be an enduring resource, then it's got to be sorted out. So 
ownership is definitely a, a big uh, area there. And the culture, organisations, people, uh, questions are going to have to get sorted out. Plus attitudes, indeed, to copyright. I, I, I mentioned at uh, 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 lunchtime, they, I love dealing with arts faculties because I get them going on the fact that, what do you think about copyright? Oh, it's terrible. It's a restraint on my creativity. We should be able to create without thinking about all these rules, these sections of the act and all the rest of it. Then I get them on to uh, what do you think of plagiarism? Oh, it's terrible when students copy stuff without giving the acknowledgement. Then I get them on to oh, well, what about uh, your, your stuff being copied? Are you fearful of uh, people doing that? Oh, it's terrible. I, I, that's my product. I should be paid for what I produce. Now, that's what value when I think I'm trying to get them to actually reconcile these notions. It's a very interesting challenge. Um, so, uh, again, uh, 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 just the, the body, uh, we try to stay out of politics and campaigning, which is sometimes a pain because most of our constituency are users. But we have to remember as well that many of our constituency uh, are also rights holders and producers. And we ha it's all a balance. And it's not just about, again, it would be lovely to say anything that has education, the philosopher's stone is referred to, referred to, that's okay. I can put up here, because it's for good. Education's good, therefore I should be able to show Disney films and put them up online and everything, as much as I like. And uh, that's not going to be a sustainable world, um, uh, unless Disney chooses to create a Commons license, it's uh, material. I think you might be waiting a while for that one, I'm afraid. Um, the open agenda's coming along. Uh, these slides are Creative Commons license under CC BY. Uh, of course, we, we did think about, we, we actually had our own bespoke license beforehand, which was actually only a few sentences long, it's very simple, and allowed education establishments to use it widely. But we went over to Creative Commons because it's familiar. And that, that was more important, even though I, I suspect few of you have probably read the Creative Commons legal code, the, the actual legal document behind that. And the reason is because you don't need to, you just need with little symbols, and that's for the most part fine. But you have to be careful, a German company went bust because it used open source software, not reading the particular open license that was applied to the software. And in fact, there were various restrictions on commercial use, and it was making commercial use. And it got fined about 10,000 euros, but the legal bills actually sent it under. Good one for the lawyers there. That's it. Um, so the open agenda's there. But I find it interesting, again, I think about, I think about one of my experiences. I was a European community law lecturer, as it was European community law back then. And uh, it was found that my handouts were being used in a neighbouring institution. Now, I don't suppose it was because my handouts were brilliant, but it was because I think they had a large turnover of staff in European community law teaching it. Um, so I went and mentioned this to the head of the department, and, it was, and, and I fell into it myself. It was indignation. How could they ever copy my stuff? It was terrible. So the head of the department came up with a, the solution, and that would be for in future, my handouts would be photocopied on blue paper to stop it being further photocopied. That would have been great for dyslexic students in the class, and, uh, or anyone, indeed. Um, and of course, what I should have thought is, actually, I'm flattered. And maybe I should contact them and say, look, do you want to use my materials? Because after all, we tend to call that in academia publication, <laughs> which is actually a pretty good thing. And that's, uh, so trying to get people to read things is good. So actually, Whenever we ta start talking about Creative uh, Commons and uh, open licensing, <coughs> the first uh, reaction is we can't do that because we might sell our materials. That's the senior uh, strategic ma uh, uh, decision of this, uh, the senior management that tends to be. And then we get down to actually discussing how much of the materials are sellable as they are. Because generally what happens is the expertise is sellable, not the materials. And we're, we're still working on those mo models. But uh, one of the reports and papers I did, Strategic Management of IPR for OER, Open Educational Resources, uh, I found particularly interesting doing a few years ago and trying to work on new agendas. Because actually, yeah, when you get down to it, the sharing your stuff is actually more of an academic idea than trying to keep it uh, under wraps. And for those of you, which I suspect most of you, when you create materials, do you always put a license on it? See, this is the biggest bugbear. Well done. That's it. You probably ought, most of you at least, have cameras with you uh, on a phone, perhaps, uh, or have a digital camera at home. How many of you have found the license setting? Because there's all those white exposure and light level settings and all those things I don't understand on it. But actually, when you produce the photograph, probably the most important thing for the, its future in the world is who it gets shared with. Okay, if you choose to keep it, on your camera and let it die with the technology or yourself, so be it. 
Um, but for the most part, everyone's sticking up somewhere else. And you, as you probably know, the number of photographs in the world is doubling every year or something stupid like that. It's an exponential growth. But the most important thing is that, well, we have a directive on orphan